Hey guys, thanks for watching along. What you're seeing here is me laying out my concept for a Maloof inspired rocking chair. Basically a Maloof rocking chair, but it is fairly complex in its simplicity. The structure, the design, the flow of materials. And so to better understand it, I started to draw it and give me some basics height width length height and uh, I based it on a chair that I had in my shop just a typical uh, craftsman style chair that I had there and uh, I just did some typical measurements seats typically 17 inches high and then what you see me doing is transferring those rough shapes onto a piece of two inch walnut and then I'm defining the one side that I'm about to cut because I went from the paper loosely transferred it to the wood and now I'm really refining these shapes and these concepts. I'm calling them shapes and concepts because they're not necessarily finished templates. I've seen other people make these chairs with templates. Because the chair is so sculptural, I didn't feel the need to make templates. I just knew that there was going to be a lot of free form. And so once I make one side, I use that same side to make the other side. So I use the shapes to draw the matching pairs for the opposite side of the chair. And I left the back legs and the, the back rest. I'm not sure what these particular aspects of the chair are called, but the, the uprights that would carry the headrest and the back of the arms. I left them extra long, not really knowing. I just wanted to have the space to cut them Ultimately, I left them as long as you see them here. Also, I wanted the chair to have a nice gesture. Knowing again that it would be sculptural, I had a lot of leeway. Using a bandsaw is something I've been, I've been doing pretty much my whole life. Since I'm about eight years old, I started using a bandsaw, a Delta 14 inch, which I still own, that my dad had. And uh, between me and my dad, we got about 20 different bandsaws. And you see me cut most of the material today on a 1920s American woodworking machines bandsaw that I got from Louisville, Kentucky at an auction. Paid $600 for it. And shipping was about another $600 from Louisville. And uh, making the seat here, the seat blank. One regret, I, if you notice that middle board there is a little deteriorated. That's where the board sat on the end and got wet from the floor where it was sitting. Uh, I thought I was well out of the zone. My only regret is that the seat is probably about an inch to an inch and a half too shallow. But I always say you go to school on the first one. And I certainly went to school on this one. I learned an unbelievable amount. And, you know, if, if your guys are out there, anybody's out there contemplating, just jump in. Don't worry about the wasted materials. The education is more important than the materials. You'll be able to make it again better and sexier the second time. Now, I did a little research, of course, on the Maloof style of joinery. And this seems to be uh, the typical type of joinery where these pockets will then get routered so that there's a pocket inside of a pocket and I'm glad I left everything big it gives me room to draw on it and again knowing that this is going to be completely sculpted later I give myself plenty of room to come back to it now you know I could have made a much tighter drawing it wouldn't have saved me any material it just gives me the ability to make a lot more fair transitions having more material gives me more choices later on so that's why I left the legs a little bit thicker and here you see me doing the joinery and I'm just using a little battery powered uh, DeWalt trim router it's nice that they don't have cords laying around and I used the chisels to just help me define my line so that I didn't have splinters it's nice sometimes when you use a router if you can define your line with a chisel or a razor blade and then it doesn't get in your way the fuzz from the edge of your cut doesn't hide your line and you could make a nice precise cut and like I said you see that pocket one grabs the other and it's a really smart joint just trimming it up making sure it gets tighter and tighter and I'm not very good at joinery I've never been really good at joinery and uh, it's, it's usually super super tight or 
just past being perfect. I can never land on that perfect spot. And I did pretty good here. Not perfect, but I did better than I expected. And I was relieved to see that uh, most of the Maloof chairs use screws. And I can only assume primarily it's because you have to take it apart and put it back together so often that it's important to be able to sit in it, feel certain things, put it back together, take it apart, adjust, and screws really is the best option. And with that joinery and gluing that up uh, with the screws and the joinery itself, it, it's plenty strong. And here I just uh, drilled the holes and I typically use Robertson screws, the square, the square ended screws. And uh, to be able to get that wax, I wax the screws to be able to get them in and out more easily. At least in that initial screw in. And you notice I bury the heads. I just use a Forstner bit so that when I put the screw in, I use a Forstner bit and then a regular drill bit. And now that I'm happy where the uprights are, I'm going to begin to make my headrest. And this was the very first taste of me really sculpting. This is something I'm very happy and comfortable doing, sculpting on these old saws. And these saws have, have, have three of these, by the way. And uh, this is an unbelievable three-phase 30-inch disc sander, two-sided Oliver Pattern Makers disc sander. I, I, in my old age, I want machines that don't stall and I want to be able to push something into a machine and just have it chew it up, eat it. The bandsaw is, is such a pleasure to work on. It does not stall and it cuts through material like butter. And for someone that loves to sculpt on the bandsaw, it is really, it's really like my, my dream come true to be able to sculpt on that bandsaw. And the other two that I have are very similar to it. It just has a certain unstoppability you could see me just breezing through that wood there of course I sped it up for time because you know every one of these little segments can be its own video and there I'm just taking away everything that's not the chair I mean that's kind of a cliche but literally just knowing I'm gonna smooth everything over and just jumping right in and taking everything away and I had a couple different plans for certain parts of this joinery, but I did not prepare for it. So I didn't do 100% Maloof joinery where every single flat surface literally will uh, fill it into another flat surface. I have some flat surfaces hitting flat surfaces and some fillets hitting fillets. And... Now I'm really starting to dig in. This is the whole reason I wanted to do this, is just so I could really dig into the bandsaw sculpting. And it's just a breeze on a giant machine like this. If you can get your hands on a 36-inch bandsaw made around the turn of the century, I highly recommend it. They're so heavy for a reason. Nothing vibrates. Nothing's buzzing, clicking. You don't hear any sheet metal vibrating. It's, it's just incredible. And now here I'm sculpting the, the long uprights that are the back legs into the back rest. And really starting to feel those sweeping lines, the, 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 what we're going for. Here there's all kinds of tools that do this. And I just use that, that tenon, tenon creator that you would use for doing sort of Adirondack style furniture. And that gave me the, the beginning of this peg or this tenon. And then as long as I have enough to rub onto the back of the saw blade there, you know, the fin, I like to call it the, uh, the rudder of the saw blade, I can just keep spinning that and make that tenon as long as I want. And so if you think you need a tenon maker, if you have a bandsaw, you already have a tenon maker. But you see how I started it there. And those tenons are just long enough to poke through the top of the, the armrests. And I did add a lot of screws to this that I did not necessarily show. For instance, after I glued on the arms, I did put screws in the arm uprights into the back, into the, the back uprights, into the arms. And now I'm using a Arbitec cutting head to pocket out the, the seat. And this is the bottom. And I, did, uh, I didn't do as drastic a, as Maloof would have done on some of Maloof style chairs. Those leg grooves are very, very, very deep. 
and I just didn't have the confidence to go that far that fast just yet at least not yet and now I'm drawing what's going to become the lumbar support so the, the backrest and it goes from like a nice big support like or you see that right where my left hand is it goes from a nice uh, pronounced backrest to a sweeping curve and once I was happy with it I actually made that S curve about three times before I was happy with it and this walnut that I got, I get from upstate New York here and upstate, there's a place called Ghent Hardwoods and Ghent, New York. It's about 30 miles from where I live. And you can really count on them. They always have good quality materials. And recently I made a set of stools on my channel. And those I made for my friend Sawmill walnut and then I needed to make four more for customers I sold two to two people so I needed to make four more so I went and I bought a big stock of this walnut a thousand dollars about across maybe I don't know, 10 planks and this is from that same buy now I'm making uh, the back the back spindles or the back supports and again just freestyle carving on the blade Give myself some guidance so that there's a certain semblance of regularity between them. And just trying to stay in the same spot on each line. Sometimes I split the line, sometimes I stay outside of it because it's easier to take away than to add. Let's say if I went too far inside the line on one of them, then I'd have to go back and go kind of keep them all somewhat the same. You know, at least my OCD would would kick in and I would have to go back and cut them all wrong if I made one wrong. So to avoid that, I just try and stay outside the line as opposed to get inside of it. Just sculpting, all this has to be round. I know it all has to be round based on the loaf style. So I figured I'd do it as closely as possible for the first one and then I could really start to take some artistic license on my next chair. And I'm using this uh, Shinto, I think it's, maybe I'm pronouncing it wrong. It's this, it looks like a bunch of hacksaw blades riveted together. It is one of the most unbelievably effective tools when doing this. Of course, a spoke shave is great, but sometimes you get gnarly grain. No matter which direction you go on the spoke shave, you're not getting a good cut in some cases. And so you got to use that Shinto rasp. So I'm jumping around between the spoke shave, depending upon... I'm going in and out of a grain pocket and then see me using the rasp there. And I had a, a 5 8 hole and that 5 8 hole I drilled into just a piece of scrap and I wanted to make sure that as I shaved either end of the spindles I wanted to make sure they fit into that hole and when they did I knew that I was good. And lot a lot a lot of sanding which I spared the viewer I didn't want to bore everybody with all the sanding I show you the rasping work and the draw knife work and here I'm just uh, drilling I started really developing a confidence when I got into this project and you know somebody might take that and bring it over to a drill press I was like you know what I'm just gonna put a hole here it doesn't have to be dead perpendicular to the rest of the machine or the rest of the unit it doesn't matter it's going to be plugged up with the spindle no one's going to be able to tell how straight it is or isn't and you notice I was lucky enough to keep all those snug nothing was falling out this was a little difficult to get in but of course I got it in and, and that forced the backrest the curve forced the backrest kind of at a little bit of an angle which I didn't expect but ultimately I really loved the gesture it gave me and I'll show you that in a minute once I start shaping it into the, the uprights of the backrest. Just a lot of this. And just for the edit, I just jumped around a little bit. A lot of sculpting with this rasp. The rasp has a fine side and a rough side. And I found myself using the rough side almost exclusively. Use the rough side and then you go to the, the battery operated sander. Now this is a tricky part because I had to be able to get this as good as I possibly could because if I was going to glue it all back together I wanted to make sure that I wasn't leaving anything that needed a lot of work. And you'll see as I began to build it I didn't read up or do anything. I really wanted to try and kind of just look at pictures and just figure this out on my own. And 
I really started getting getting into the the shaping of the legs. It's just kept the more weight it lost, uh, the the more I got into shaping and really starting to find the gesture inside of the chair. And there you see I'm just doing my little splines. And I'm just using West Systems Epoxy and I mix it with sawdust from, in some cases, this is sawdust actually from the saw, the bandsaw, it was, so it was a little bit more rougher. And in some cases for the more finer glue up, really when I'm trying to fill cracks and whatnot, I, I use it right out of the, the palm sander. But I was going to say, I started saying before, is starting to put this together, the order of operations sort of dictated itself or revealed itself. I should say, glue the legs on, start shaping it, sand everything, and then glue the backrest in. That would be the last, well, as far as the major chair assembly goes, the last thing I did was the, the runners. But see, I glued everything up and I kneeled on it to make sure all four legs were touching the ground at the same time. And now I'm gluing the legs, oh, sorry, the, the armrests on. And I glued them on, and I left the joinery kind of square inside of the bandsaw cut at the back where your elbows would be. And then I put screws through the uprights into it. I don't think I showed it, though, in the edit. I remember, it was sort of an afterthought at the end of the day, and I had already packed my camera up in the car. And then I plug all the screw holes with this resin mix, mixed with walnut sawdust. Now I could have cut a plug and banged a plug in there, which is probably what most people would do. But I was happy with just putting walnut epoxy in there. And now this is another super fun part for me, sculpting and really starting to find that sexy transition between one part into the other, making the entire assembly one smooth gesture at a risk of overusing that word but that's really what I kept trying to go for just one smooth transition into another and this is a beautiful rasp that I've had for a long time and for doing those inside curves just cutting that little tenon off that becomes a top using that incredible rasp I did between the bandsaw and that rasp, I did probably almost at least 95% of the shaping with the Shinto and the bandsaw. And the epoxy mix fills in some of the gaps. I'm not going to lie, um, I'm no perfect joiner here, but you can see I got pretty tight. Really in the video, the thing, you can see the thing holding together. Now I did the... I did the... Uh, the power carver and it left a lot of little grooves and a lot of ridges so I went back in there with that piece of wood with some sandpaper glue to it to just knock down all those high spots and again this is really where I really have a good time is just shaping and that backrest is kind of more at an angle than the uprights and you see how I have to transition of the bottom into the upright and try and get them to blend and I knew I'd had plenty of material and if anything things would just get slimmer and sexier so I wasn't afraid to lose too much material again you see how the top is poked out and the bottom of the headrest is poked back so I just got to make sure I get the transition nice and tight at this point the headrest is screwed in you can see where the screws are in there the, on the sides of the upright. And now I'm to the palm sander. See, I've taken the, the rungs out. Now I'm just working in those transitions with the palm sander. And I'm using 60 grit and then an 80 grit and then a 120 grit. And I don't think I want any higher than 120 on this entire sanding job. Not getting those, 
backrest spindles back in there. And now I got everything in place. All the spindles snugged in. I put those two wedges in to keep the joint open while I smeared in the epoxy mix with superfine powder. And then let it squeeze out. And then I just rub it in with my finger just to fill that joint. Did the best I could to, to make those nice mirrored surfaces. Crack in the, in the wood. And again, now that it's going to be glued together, I need to really be cognizant of the fact that I don't want to leave too much to do inside the underside of the headrest because it's not easy to get out and have the spindle right there to contend with. So I sanded everything before I glued it up. Now it's time to make the runners or the rockers. And I made them out of a 2x4 first. I made three different versions before I was happy with them. And then I used it as my template. That's the one you see sitting there on the bandsaw. Mm, this is, I can't really remember exactly how many two by tens I, I ended up using a walnut, maybe four for the whole chair. But I mean, of course, there's plenty left over. There's plenty of scraps. Plenty of odd shaped scraps. And <clears throat> This one had a bit of a burl in it, so when I sanded it, it looked really nice in the end. But of course, burls are dangerous because they don't really have good structure. They could break in any direction. But so far, so good. I mean, the chair is working. I've been sitting in it for the last few days, checking my text messages at work, and everything seems pretty good. <clears throat> There's my Oliver 30-inch sander, which is just so invaluable now that I own it. I used to think, oh, my 12-inch disc sander is all I'm ever going to need. I gave it away. And again, just sculpting and the idea of, I've looked at some of the Maloof transitional spots where the legs go into the, the rockers and I just took a little bit of artistic license here and just, I wanted the, the legs to look like they were creating a bulge on the rocker. So if you notice where I mark them, I put them underneath off camera and mark them. And uh, now I'm shaping them. Again with the spoke shave, and I got to keep flip flopping it around because uh, when you cut a curve into a straight grain, you get all kinds of unpredictable grain directions. Using that rasp again, and in a minute you'll see me using the draw knife. Yeah, here it is. The draw knife is it's such a pleasure to use a brand new sharp draw knife. You feel like you could do anything with it, especially a nice, perfectly straight one. That's a different type of rasp with a flat side and a, and a it's sort of like a bastard file rasp. And you can see this, it's just such a pleasure to use a, a new draw knife. Palm sanding. There's a crack there right at the end of the rocker. I ended up filling that in with that epoxy mix with some sawdust. And you could see this kind of looked like a clown's foot. <laughs> but once it was on the chair, it really worked nicely. And you see what I'm doing there? I just have a piece of thin material with a sanding block on one side. And it one matches, while it rubs on one side, it's matching the surface to the other. So it was a good way to get those two surfaces to mate. And here I just put a little bit of wood glue on there. No epoxy this time. Just a little bit of wood glue and just screw it home. I pre-drilled it. The ends of those legs are really slim. And uh, I was really happy with this. After sitting back and looking at it, there's a couple things I would change for my next one. Using the San Maloof Poly Oil Finish. And this is a really beautiful finish. It really takes its time, soaks in. It doesn't dry the way a typical poly would dry. It's, it's like an oil finish that you rub in off camera, I rubbed it in quite a bit. And the next morning it was still a little bit wet in some spots and I rubbed it in more. And this chair is, has a beautiful texture that I believe is just gonna get polished with use. My buddy Ryan's helping me brush that on. And like I said, I just wanted to apply it. 
and I just put my heat stamp under the foot. And this was, like I said, a hundred times. This is really going to school, you know, pick a project that you want to learn how to do and just do it. Don't be overly concerned. Don't be so uptight. Just jump in and have fun. My very first rocking chair from Pile of Walnut, and it's not going to be my last. I really, really enjoyed this project. Thank you, Rockla, for the opportunity to force me out of my comfort zone. I'm that much smarter now. Thank you, and thank you for watching. And thank you, Sam Maloof.